great to be back here on the MAPS Canada webinar series. My name is Shannon Smadella and I'm your host for the series, Examining the Psychedelic Renaissance. We are now in season two. And I just wanna say that it's been a pleasure hosting both season one and season two of the series. And it's been even more of a pleasure getting to know all of these amazing speakers leading the way in the psychedelic renaissance. So if you can believe it, we are now in episode 12 of season two. And we've had a diverse array of speakers that have already presented and four very special ones that still have to present. Each of these speakers and panels that we've had will be showing up to share important information and their take on the psychedelic renaissance. So at MAPS Canada, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, we are on the forefront of conducting studies to develop psychedelics into safe and legal medical treatments since our formation to conduct and publish scientific research and education supporting the beneficial use of psychedelic medicines, MAPS Canada relies on public donations and fundraising initiatives. The funds raised from this webinar series go to fund this research. So thank you so much for being here because your investment makes a difference. To view the different studies that MAPS is currently working on, of course, you can find these on the website at mapscanada.org and maps.org. Also, to make this webinar possible, we have many volunteers at MAPS Canada that help out. So I just want to take this time to say a huge thank you to all of them, the people that work behind the scenes in tech, and uh, everyone that makes this possible. So thank you so much to our volunteers, and also thank you to our amazing sponsors. If you haven't checked out the perks that they've supplied for season two, we'll be putting a link in the chat afterwards. So without any further ado, we're gonna start with a talk from our guest today, Wade Davis. After that, we will have a Q&A session, so make sure and put your questions in the box at the bottom and vote up your questions because we will be prioritizing those. And also let us know today where you are tuning in from in the chat. So I always like reading Wade's bio because it is so amazing and so full of wonderful things. Wade Davis is a writer, photographer, a filmmaker whose work has taken him from the Amazon to Tibet, Africa to Australia, Polynesia to the Arctic. Explorer and resident at the National Geographic Society from 2000 to 2013. He is currently Professor of Anthropology and the BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia. Author of 22 books, including One River, The Wayfinders, and Into the Silence, winner of the 2012 Samuel Johnson Prize, the top nonfiction prize in the English language. He holds degrees in anthropology and biology and received his PhD in ethnobotany, all from Harvard University. His many film credits include Light at the Edge of the World, an eight hour documentary series written and produced for the NGS. Davis, one of 20 honorary members of the Explorers Club, is the recipient of 12 honorary degrees, as well as the 2019 Gold Medal from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, the 2011 Explorers Medal, the 2012 David Fairchild Medal, Medal for Botanical Exploration, the 2015 Centennial Medal of Harvard University, the 2017 Roy Chapman Andrews Society Distinguished Explorer Award, the 2017 Sir Christopher Ondachi Medal for Exploration, and the 2018 Mungo Park Medal from the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. In 2016, he was made a member of the Order of Canada. In 2018, he became an honorary citizen of Columbia. His latest book, Magdalena, River of Dreams, was just published by Knopf in September of 2020. So if you haven't checked that one out, it's available for purchase now. So today in our webinar, we are going to speak with Wade and he'll be recounting the wonderful and fascinating story of his counter encounters with Buffal Alvarius. So let's welcome Wade Davis. Hi, Shannon. Thank you very much for having me again. Hi, Wade. It is so great to have you back here. And uh, I've been waiting months for the story. So well, <laughs> super little, excited. It's a little bit of levity, I think, in the in the dark winter of our uh, um, discontent. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm delighted to be back and supporting MAPS. And I, I think that, um, you know, those of us who have been around for a long time in this space, um, dealing with the 
incredible folly of the war on drugs. You know, a trillion dollars, more people today after 50 years um, using worse drugs in worse ways than, than ever before. The amount of agony that it's caused, the, the, the fact that because of the war on drugs, there are actually more Americans with criminal and arrest records than with college degrees. You know, it's so it's so discouraging that sometimes I think you have to have a bit of a a, a good sense of humor. And I, I think I learned that from my good friend, the late Terrence McKenna, Dennis's revered brother. And uh, Terrence just had this way. I remember when we were down in the Ampiaco in Northwest Amazon doing the research for, for what became Dennis's PhD, looking at these orally active tryptamines. And every day we'd go out into the forest and make these preparations. And every night Dennis would lie in his hammock and uh, we dose him and then see what happened and nothing was happening. And one day I came upon uh, a very miserable Terrence McKenna. He didn't like the jungle. Uh, and I said, Terrence, what, what's the problem? He says, I feel like a crystal of sugar on the tongue of a beast impatiently awaiting dissolution. <laughs> and, then, and then he pulls from his pocket this, this pure vial of chemical pure DMT. And I, and I said, Terrence, I was kind of the titular not the head of the expedition, but because I was an anthropologist, because I spoke Spanish, I kind of was a liaison with the uh, the Bora and the Witoto people. And I said, Terrence, what did you bring that for? I mean, you're not really supposed to bring pure molecules to the to the forest. And he looked at me and he said, Wade, you know these shaman, they're always fucking with dosage. I just brought this kid along to let him know what kind of ballpark we're used to playing in. So I mean, you know, I think I think you. Have, and so anyway, that's all a preamble for this. Um, talk that I'm going to give that I call Smoking Toad. And I think the whole story of Bufo um, is, is wonderfully metaphorical and, and revealing of the, the real absurdity of the war on drugs. So for everyone out there, that's kind of the sub uh, context or the subtext of this, of this whole presentation. So I'm going to go to a screen share now, um, uh, Shannon, if that's okay. That um, sounds great. Take and, it away. And, uh, I won't be able to see you, but I gather you'll be able to see me. Well, anyway, the story of the magic toads began for me innocently enough in Haiti in the spring of 1982 in the temple of a Vudun Bokor, a negative priest, some would say a sorcerer, as he and his companions, the, the band known as the malfacteurs, the evildoers, were gathering uh, ingredients for a poison reputedly used by the secret society to create zombies, the legendary living dead. And at the time, I was a graduate student of at Harvard with Richard Evans Schultes, and he had sent me to secure the formula of this reputed poison, uh, document its preparation, and collect samples of various ingredients. And I had actually, after a, a series of sort of complicated negotiations, I had actually entered the temple of my friend Marcel Pierre that morning and found a number of ingredients drying on the clothesline. And among them was the flattened carcass of this enormous toad. And from the size alone, I, I guessed it was the Bufo Marinus, a native of the American tropics, circum-Caribbean, uh, and then it later found its way up the Amazon. And it's very, very common and, and certainly poisonous. And so on Easter Sunday, 1982, I passed through U.S. Customs at Kennedy Airport in New York, and I had this kind of kaleidoscopic suitcase made of surplus 7-Up tin cans printed in Saudi Arabia that had somehow got to Port-au-Prince. And it's an adage in Haiti that faced with nothing, the Haitians managed to adorn their lives with their imagination, and tin becomes instruments. And rubber becomes shoes, and they had made a suitcase out of this surplus tin. And in my suitcase, I had all the ingredients of the so-called zombie poison, both all the stages of elaboration, but all the raw ingredients, um, polychaete worms, marine fish, lizards, tarantulas, preserved in alcohol, dried plant material, uh, rum bottles containing the so-called antidote, um, seed necklaces, unidentified powders, voodoo charms, and a dried toad on the top of the load, as well as human tibia and a skull at the bottom of the case. I also had a cardboard box full of herbarium specimens and concealed in my duffel bag on my back 
was a live and very active specimen of Bufo Marinus. And I had no permits whatsoever because I hadn't expected to secure the formula of this poison so quickly. And the reason I was able to do that, as I describe in my book, The Serpent and the Rainbow, is because the poison itself has not seen to be any secret at all. You simply had to ask for it. Um, and of course, that's complicated within the belief system of, of the religion. But the bottom line is I had these ingredients and I had no permits and I didn't know what to do. And it was Easter Sunday, uh, 1982. And I opened the case away from uh, so that the top came up so that only the customs agent would see the ingredients, which was just filled to the gunnels with every conceivable bit of gore one could imagine. And what I'm going to say now, I don't want to shock you with my language, but I'm simply quoting word for word exactly what your U.S. Customs agent said to me on that distant um, Easter Sunday in 1982. His voice had been tempered by the back streets of Brooklyn, and he looked up at me and he said, look, it's Easter fucking Sunday. I didn't even want to fucking work today. I don't know who the fuck you are. Just get the fuck out of here. Well, that's how the zombie poison came into America. Now, the following morning, including this live Buffalo Marinus toad that was in my, my, my duffel, the following morning, uh, I made my way through the dark corridors of the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, naturally leaving the various ingredients with the various specialists. In the herbarium, we looked at the plants involved in the poison from the herpetologists, uh, I brought the fish to the ichthyologist, and of course, from the herpetologist, I quickly learned that the toad in question was indeed Bufo marinus. Now, this toad, as I poked around the literature, uh, has quite a story. The large parotid glands that you can see just on the neck of the creature, these um, massive glands just behind the head, had been described in the literature as veritable chemical factories, and they produce and secrete at least 26 compounds, all of which are bio biologically active. And they include both bufotenine, a reputed hallucinogen at that time in the literature, but more interestingly and more ominously, two very powerful cardioactive steroids and cardioactive um, glycosides, um, bufogenin, and bufotoxin, its derivative. And these are roughly 100 times stronger than digitoxin derived from digitalis as a heart stimulant. Now, even as I eliminated the toad from the zombie investigation, because remember, I wasn't looking for uh, a plant or an animal that could kill. Lots of plants and animals can kill. I was actually looking for a natural product found in the environment in Haiti that could make someone appear to be dead so profoundly it could fool a Western trained physician. And I would find that in these curious um, uh, uh, fish uh, that contain the strange um, complicated neurotoxin uh, tetrodotoxin. But again, that's another story. It was clear to me that Bufo was placed in the zombie preparation in the same spirit that many of the toxic plants or the polychaete worms or anything that was kind of dangerous and toxic for really um, magical reasons was placed into the preparation. But as, but as I did that literature search to, in effect, eliminate Bufo Marinus from consideration as being the key ingredient in the zombie poison, I was astonished to learn that anthropologists um, Mayanists in particular had long speculated that Bufo Marinus had been used as a hallucinogen not just by the classic Maya, but in Central America, going back to the, proto uh, the prototypic civilization, the Olmec. And it struck me immediately on the face of it, knowing what I did about these cardioactive glycosides, that it seemed highly unlikely that such a um, a toad could be used um, as anything but an ordeal poison, certainly not, it seemed, as an entheogen. But at the same time, this, these reports were coming in from highly reputable Mayan uh, scholars, Michael Coe at Yale in particular. And of course, the discovery of a psychoactive toad would be significant because up until this point in 1982, 
all known hallucinogens or uh, entheogens were from plants. Uh, no hallucinogenic agent at that time had been found in the animal kingdom. So naturally I was drawn to this um, Mayan literature and the arguments um, for the, in favor of the toad as a hallucinogen uh, rested on several lines of evidence. First of all, throughout Central America, the toad was a prominent symbol, particularly in Olmec and Mayan and Aztec iconography. Any number of artifacts and small serving bowls, um, various um, ritual objects have obvious toad representations with especially graphic portrayals of these distinctive parotid glands. So that was interesting. Second, at a number of Mayan sites and Olmec sites, Bufo Marinus bones had been reported to be found in great abundance and often in ritual context. And indeed, it was a concentration and distribution of these Bufo Marinus remains at the Olmec site of San Lorenzo that had led Michael Coe um, to first suggest that the toad had been used as a drug. I didn't necessarily buy that because, of course, in the 1960s, anthropologists were finding drugs everywhere, competing with Carlos Castaneda for the public space. A third line of evidence was a report that the toad, Bufo Marinus, contained in its glands bufotenin, a compound that had been found by Schultes in hallucinogenic stuff, snuffs known as yopo, made by South American Indians, particularly in the upper Orinoco, from the seeds of a legume at an anthra peregrina. Now this plant, this tree grows uh, on, on the open grasslands of the Llanos of Colombia and all into Venezuela, as well as in the Guianas and the Rio Branco area of Amazonian Brazil. So this was interesting, an interesting correlation. And finally, there was another report from the medical literature of an experiment conducted in the 1950s by a physician called Howard Fabian, who had injected pure bufotenin intravenously into human subjects and had reported the induction or the, um, uh, or, or the, or the, um, the causing of hallucinations. Finally, all of these Mayan scholars, these archeologists, um, uh, all those in, in favor of this um, hypothesis that Bufo Marinus had been used as a hallucinogenic agent, all cited an unpublished account from an anthropologist by the name of Timothy Nab of the contemporary use of Bufo Marinus as a hallucinogen um, in the region of Veracruz, Mexico. So, that was the evidence. Now, on the face of it, it wasn't very conclusive. After all, even if the Mayan iconography and Olmec and Aztec iconography does represent Bufo Marinus, it doesn't necessarily mean that the ancient peoples were using the toad as a hallucinogen. Ritual symbols, of course, incorporate a wide range of meanings. And given the remarkable fecundity, the fertility uh, and productivity of the toad, you could also speculate with each equal assurance that the toad motifs seen in this iconography uh, related rather not to the use of the substance as a hallucinogen, but rather to notions of fertility, to water or rain, or even given the life cycle of toads to some notion of sacred metamorphosis and renewal. By the same token, there was not, there's not always a direct relationship between a decorative motif applied to ceramic wares and the purported use of the object. In, in one critical review of the hallucinogen hypothesis, an anthropologist noted rather wryly that today in the central market of Guatemala City, native women sell a great variety of modern toad-shaped, toad-decorated artifacts. Does that imply, he asks, that these little old ladies secretly imbibe mind-expanding um, doses of toad juice cocktails under their counters? Well, of course, the answer was no. 
The other thing that struck me is that one of the things we know about the use of sacred plants in the Americas, be it San Pedro cactus on the coast of Peru, even ayahuasca in the remote reaches of the Amazon, and certainly peyote first brought into the human imagination and repertoire by the Tarahumara in the Cordillera Occidental in Mexico, these substances turned up in the chronicles consistently. I mean, the, the one thing about the early Spaniards is they were great observers, and the priests were often physicians, the physicians were priests, and priest physician were the chronicles of the conquest. And so we see reports frequently in the literature of the use of these devil plants um, by the indigenous people. If Bufo of um, Marinus had been such an important source of an entheogen by these ancient civilizations, the Aztec, the Olmec, and indeed the Maya, why wasn't it reported in the chronicles? Because it wasn't. And so this paucity of um, historical um, evidence um, of the hallucinogenic use of these substances was another um, uh, uh, a chink in the armor, if you will. Um, you know, if these substances had really been used in ritual context in such a way that they would be memorialized, carved into stone on the on the temples of this ancient civilization, surely the Spaniards would have um, made some mention of it. Or at least logic suggests that. And the the other point is that the anthropologists always draw attention to the abundance of Bufo Marinus remains as a dominant component of the amphibious remains in all of the midden sites, um, and, and particularly at San Lorenzo. And as Michael Coe noted, these toads are a puzzle, as they cannot be skinned without an extremely dangerous poison getting into the meat. We're looking at the possibility that the Olmecs use them for a hallucinogenic substance called bufotenin, which is one of the active ingredients. Well, you'll see in a moment how uh, misguided that statement was. First of all, a survey of the archeological literature shows that a significant quantity of bufo marinus bones have in fact been found in middens at sites throughout Central America leading other archaeologists to believe that the pre-Columbian peoples of the region used the toad, in fact, as meat after carefully cutting away the toxic parotid glands. A friend of mine, Richard Hansen, working in Panama, himself butchered and cooked several specimens, which he was pleased to note tasted, perhaps predictably, rather pleasantly like smoked chicken. And on the basis of both the temporal and spatial distribution of Bufo Marinus remains, he proposed the toad had been used not as a drug, but indeed as a survival food, a suggestion that is in fact partially corroborated by the fact that the toad today in the upper reaches of the Amazon, amongst the Campo, the Ashaninka, as they're properly known, uh, is used today, and I've eaten it with them. Now, the central um, weakness of this hallucinogen hypothesis was the inability of the proponents, none of whom were trained, as our good brother Dennis McKenna certainly is trained, in pharmacology and in chemistry. And, and it was not clear to me, even as an anthropologist, how Bufo Marinus venom could possibly be safely consumed. Yes, it was true that the glands had had within them bufotenin, a methylated derivative of serotonin and known constituent of these South American snuffs. But as I said, also present in the venom were these um, um, uh, uh, cardiac steroids, bufotoxin and bufogenin, highly toxic. In, indeed, ingesting a straight maceration of the parotid glands would almost certainly cause heart failure long before the recipient by chance enjoyed the useful states of altered consciousness induced by bufotenin. 
Um, and it seems highly unlikely that the Olmec or the Maya or the Aztec would have wanted to poison in vast numbers um, their people, let alone their priests, who presumably would have been the ones taking the drug. So only if there had been some uh, process, folk preparation developed that somehow selectively neutralized these toxic glycosides could Bufo Marinus ever have been an orally administered hallucinogen. Well, an old character, a good friend of mine, uh, by the name of Kennedy, a kind of a visionary young um, anthropologist, had, had um, tried to kind of concoct a theory that would fit the, 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 this challenge. And she suggested, for example, without a trace of evidence in a, a paper in current anthropology that was widely cited, that somehow the Maya used ducks as bioprocessors and got the ducks to eat the toads and then somehow the poison was in the flesh of the ducks and it could be eaten and you'd get high. Of course, the problem is she proposed this kind of speculative theory and never followed up with the obvious, which would be to feed some ducks with bufo marinus and then assay the meat. Now, a more promising um, uh, line of investigation had, in fact, been undertaken by this mysterious anthropologist, Timothy Nabb, an intrepid explorer who, according to Allison Kennedy, had searched the back country of Mexico until he found someone who could prepare the drug. Nabb, Kennedy wrote in that seminal paper, has penetrated the arcana of several curanderos in the Veracruz area and details the recipe for the preparation of bufo marinus parotid glands, which eliminates the most toxic compounds. Well, that was highly intriguing, highly promising. And so I went about tracking down um, Tim Nabb. Just by chance, I was at Harvard, and by chance, I found him teaching anthropology right up the road uh, in, in at Tufts University. And as I discovered when I met with him, he had himself been rather more modest in reporting his own discovery. As it turned out, after considerable effort, he had indeed located an old curandero in the mountains of southern Veracruz, who claimed to know the formula of a preparation that had not actually been used by his people for 50 years. And although Nab persuaded the curandero to prepare the drink with a formula from memory, absol under absolutely no conditions would the old man join Timothy in sampling it. Only very reluctantly did he consent to give a dose to Nab. And from what happened, it appears that he knew something that clearly Timothy, the anthropologist, did not. Tim's intoxication was marked, as he told me, by sensations of fire and heat, convulsive muscle spasms, a pounding headache, and delirium. Timothy reported no hallucinations, and from what he told me, it appears that he merely suffered the symptoms of a severe glycosidal poisoning. He never found out whether the preparation neutralized any of the toxic compounds, for it was never analyzed. When I asked him directly whether he thought the preparation was hallucinogenic, possibly entheogenic, he looked at me like I was a fool, and he said, Hell no! This shit nearly killed me! Well... There was one more unsolved issue, and that was a report from the 1950s by this unknown chemist, Howard Fabian, who reputedly had injected pure bufotenin into the veins of prisoners, inmates at Ohio State Penitentiary. And when I finally chased down this literature, it turned out that the final dose in a series of, of, of sequential and ever-increasing dosage of the pure tryptamine bufotinin had caused mild hallucinations and delirium with the skin of the inmates turning the color of eggplant. And these hallucinations were completely ephemeral. Three months after injection, 
the subject vomited and saw red, quote, red spots passing before my eyes and red purple spots on the floor. Within two minutes, these visual phenomena were gone, but they were replaced by a yellow lens filter. That was the extent of the so-called hallucinations experienced by any of the recipients of the bufotenin injections. And what's more, later investigators using bufotenin on more prisoners tried but failed to replicate even those results. And so after their failure, they concluded that critically, although bufotenin is found in the vegetable snuffs of Latin America, uh, uh, the drug was not itself capable of producing the acute phase of intoxication. So what had happened is the anthropologist had looked at Schulte's papers and Boo Homestead's papers about Ebene, about the um, about uh, Vilka, about Yopo, these these tryptamine-based snuffs, and reported that yes, there was 5-methoxy dimethyltryptamine, yes, there was dimethyltryptamine, and yes, there was bufotenin. And therefore, ipso facto, because bufotenin was in the snuffs and the snuffs were hallucinogenic, bufotenin had to be hallucinogenic. But it was quite possible that the hallucinogenic agents were simply the much better known uh, and powerfully entheogenic, entheogenic substances, 5-methoxy and dimethyltryptamine. So that was that's sort of the fun of do, doing library research. You know, it's like doing archaeology in a in a in a bookshelf. You know, and so after a week in the library, that's all it took. I was absolutely convinced that these Mayan anthropologists, with this wildly speculative idea about Bufo uh, Marinus being an entheogen, were completely wrong. Chemical and pharmacological evidence left little doubt that the ancient peoples of Mesoamerica did not use Bufo Marinus as a hallucinogen, at least in any manner consistent with what we know about the use of entheogens amongst indigenous societies in the Americas. Societies will use poisons uh, or deals to, to just simply test the metal of the uh, initiate, but there's a difference between an ordeal poison and a true entheogen. And it may be that the toxic qualities of Bufo Marinus venom um, uh, uh, had been interpreted in culturally meaningful ways by religious practitioners, but by our definition, it clearly was not hallucinogenic. So in 1988, I published my conclusions in the Revista Academia Colombiana de Ciencias Exactas, Físicas y Naturales, a journal sufficiently obscure enough to guarantee that hopefully I would never again in my life have to think about toad venom. But then, a year or two later, living in Vancouver, my phone began to ring constantly and always in the middle of the night. And the calls always came from Toronto, from the emergency room, um, or from reporters reporting the latest case of toad licking. One in particular was a grown man who apparently had raised a pet toad for eight years and only then decided, Lord knows what caused him to do it, to decide to suck the venom glands. And evident, you know, and he, of course, had ended up in the emergency room. So it suddenly struck me that I had not been the only one uh, reading the obscure anthropological literature. And this particular individual, picking up on the mistaken idea reported by these Mayanists that Bufo Marinus could get you high, he and a friend had squeezed the glands and ingested the toxic secretion. One of them suffered near lethal seizures uh, and remained at the time of that phone call in the intensive care unit of the North York General Hospital. Now the toad in question, the pet, whose name literally was withheld from the press, presumably for privacy reasons, uh, was donated to the Metro Toronto Zoo. And of course the Toronto police were completely overwhelmed and confused. As they told me when I spoke to them, the Canadian criminal code contained nothing about licking toads. Now, meanwhile, the Americans, however, were apparently all hip 
and aware of the potential danger of this new drug craze. With characteristic zeal, the drug enforcement agent had already, uh, by 1988, identified the milky white toad venom as bufotenine, a dangerous new hallucinogen. Now, the fact that there was not a shred of evidence suggesting that the compound was psychoactive had not deterred the U.S. government from placing bufotenine in Schedule One of the Controlled Substance Act, along with heroin, LSD, and cocaine. So though it would come as a surprise to pet shop owners across America who to this day sell the homely creatures, bufo marinus for 50 uh, or 20 dollars, possession of a bufo marinus toad is in fact a criminal offense subject technically to the same sanctions reserved for heroin or crack cocaine. Well, the Toronto toad licking episode was just one small part of a wave of bufo mania that made its way to North America from Australia in the 1980s. Now the Aussies had always and had always had a complex love-hate relationship with Bufo Marinus ever since the toad was introduced to Australia in 1935. The reason it was introduced be was because it was hoped that these fertile, uh, fecund and voracious toads would somehow consume the gray-backed beetles that were then destroying sugarcane fields all over Queensland. But unfortunately, the only thing in Australia the toads did not eat was the insect pest. And so christened cane toads in memory of this agricultural folly, the creatures found themselves in a tropical paradise, devoid of predators and flush with prey. And before long, the cane toads multiplied in the millions and began to spread inland at a rate of 17 miles a year. Now, some of the Aussies found them cute and kept them as pets, dressing them in little outfits like dolls. But the toxic toads also killed um, dogs and wild things. And for many Australians, there could be no greater pleasure than driving down an open road across a migrating horde of cane toads, weaving the vehicle back and forth until the tires grew thick with the remains of flattened amphibians. One of the great sports in, uh, in Queensland is cane toad golf, and I won't even tell you what that involves. And between these two extremes in Australia, between those who loved the, animal, the cane toads and those who despised the cane toads, um, were some hippies living in the northern rainforest. And they, again, having picked up on this Mayan literature, had found in the toads their own unique pathway to oblivion. An Australian film crew recorded this testimonial from an avid, if less than articulate, toad acolyte. You, you use a little quad, you know, you use a little quantity at first, then larger, a little bit first, then well, uh, Don Juan, Don Juan, Dur says that some South American Indians, they are, uh, when they get the mescaline out of the cactus, they say that, uh, that you actually start to see, see what the world looks like through the eyes of, of the cactus. Or, well, the, 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 your toad's the same. I'm seeing the world through the consciousness of a toad. Well, why exactly someone would want to experience the world from the perspective of a toad was not a question posed to this self-confessed cane toad drug abuser. Still, the authorities could not ignore this egregious violation of the norm. And when the drug squad of Brisbane, Australia, discovered a Heinz baby food jar full of crystallized venom, they sprang into action. The conservative Queensland government reported um, Reuters uh, on April 15th, 1988, renowned for its curbs and the pleasures of the flesh, has classified toad slime as an illegal substance under its Drug Misuse Act. Well, not surprisingly, in North America, 
the media caught wind of the scandal. Discover magazine reported, Australians are forsaking traditional illegal drugs for cane toads, which they boil for a slimy, potentially lethal cocktail. In May of 1988, the tabloid, the Weekly World News, ran the first of several tabloid articles. The titles were three. Rare toads keep druggies hopping. Toad licking poses threat to North American youth. Druggies find sick new way to get high. They lick toads. Well, even the straight media got into the action. Terror toads, proclaimed the New York Times. Monster drug toad invasion feared, proclaimed the Vancouver Sun. This is my favorite from the Albany Times Union, the paper of the capital city of New York State. Minds go loose from toad juice. Well, uh, although it was not at all clear precisely how many Americans were likely to find sucking toad glands an attractive recreational pursuit, all of these reports took the breadth of the alleged problem as a given. And so as a cultural phenomena in the late 1980s, toad licking had arrived. The TV show, very popular at the time, L.A. Law, did an episode based on toads. Uh, X-Files did an episode based on toads. In San Francisco, a punk band that was quite popular changed its name to Mojo Nixon and the Toad Lickers. And it reached a low point, of course, when Beavis and Butthead and the Simpsons touted toad licking on MTV. Now, naturally, this was too much, and politicians were beginning to stir. In Georgia, Beverly Langford, a state rep, actually introduced legislation warning of the, quote, extreme dangers of toad licking becoming the designer drug of choice in today's sophisticated society. Well, Beverly did not specify what might be the new drug of choice amongst the unsophisticated. And of course, missing from all of this rhetoric was the obvious fact that an animal venom that contained no hallucinogenic agent, but which did contain uh, lethal poisons, was not likely to inspire a new drug craze. And whenever I had the chance, I tried, generally in vain, to make that clear. And finally, totally frustrated, I gave up and turned to the one person I knew who might be able to make sense of the situation. Well, many of you will know Andrew Weil. He's been a friend, a colleague, a brother of mine since Harvard days in the 1970s. And he is the most thoughtful and always has been the most thoughtful uh, spokesperson on the nature of drug use in human societies. And as a Harvard trained medical doctor, leading and inspiring the whole movement of integrative medicine with his position at University of Arizona, Andy, in a marvelous way throughout an illustrious career, has always kept one foot grounded in the realm of science while his curiosity and his imagination is free to soar. And that is the essence of a great scholar and scientist. So at any rate, this was pre-internet, and I sent by Federal Express, or maybe it was fax, a copy of my 1988 paper to Andy, who at the time was living in Tucson, the paper that I published in that obscure journal that had completely kind of devastated the idea that Bufo Marinus could be hallucinogenic. And he immediately phoned back and he said, Willie, he always called me Willie, great paper, but just one problem. I keep hearing about all these freaks around here smoking toad. Well, I called him right back and said, I'll be right down there. And that next weekend, I flew off to Arizona, and Andy and I went off into the Sonoran Desert with his main informant, a uh, white Rastafarian, six foot six vegetarian from Minneapolis called White Dog. And White Dog took us into the Sonoran Desert, and his first words to me were, have you tasted toad? And I said, no. And he said, it's an astral propellant, as if that might 
explain all. I had no idea what he was talking about, but what had occurred is that White Dog had stumbled upon an obscure pamphlet that was familiar to Andy by a man writing with a pseudonym, Albert Most, who had described not Bufo Marinus, but another toad, and reported a different set of chemicals in its glands. And as Andy and I, with White Dog, with toads found in the Sonora Desert, following White Dog's lead, began uh, with protective gear to milk the parotid glands onto glass so we could dry the venom, I realized that the Bufo Marinus was never found in the Sonoran Desert. And suddenly a light bulb went off in my head and I said to Andy, this can't be Bufo Alver uh, Marinus. And of course, Andy said, it's not. And that's when we both realized that all of those anthropologists for all of those years had been speaking and writing about the wrong species of Bufo. Now, Bufo Marinus, the toxic toad, is native to the Yucatan and all the lowland forests of Guatemala. And that naturally had drawn the attention of the Mayan archaeologists. Bufo alvarius, by contrast, is found only in the Sonoran Desert. It's one of 200 species of Bufo, and the Sonoran toad is morphologically extremely similar to that of Bufo marinus. But the constituents of the glands are very different, so different that the, the, the overall portrait of glands within the parotid, um, of chemicals within the parotid glands are actually used for taxonomic delineation to distinguish the species. And as it turns out, Bufo alvarius in its parotid glands has no less than 15% dry weight of the glands is pure 5-methoxy dimethyltryptamine. Such a concentration of a pure drug in a living creature was virtually unheard of, and 5-methoxy dimethyltryptamine is not your ordinary compound. Vegetable snuffs are extraordinarily hallucinogenic. Terence McKenna once described the subjective experience of uh, smoking 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine as being within a rifle barrel lined with the broke paintings and shot out only to land on a sea of electricity. 5-methoxy, I used to argue with Professor Schultes, could hardly be categorized as hallucinogenic because by the time the individual is under its influence, there's no one home anymore to experience the hallucinations. It doesn't create a distortion of reality. It creates a disillusion of reality. Now, we knew that these toads were uh, hardly benign. Even Bufo alvarius, as Andy reported, um, would kill dogs if they, they were mouthed by them. And it was certainly would be there for orally toxic in humans. But from the testimony that we had from White Dog and the interviews we connect we did with other toad lovers, it seemed for certain that the venom could be safely smoked. Our thought was whatever toxic constituents were in the bufo alvarius glands would be denatured in the full potential of the hallucinogenic component, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine would be realized. And on the strength of that deduction, we were confident to initiate uh, a series of self-experiments with Bufo alvarius venom obtained with the help of White Dog. Now, you may ask yourself why we weren't willing to do the same smoking experiment with Bufo marinus. The answer is very simple. In the profile of the drugs in Bufo marinus glands, we had not been able to identify one agent, including Bufo tenin, that we actually thought was hallucinogenic. So why bother to put yourself at risk of even smoking the toxic cardioactive steroids when there was nothing in the gland, or so it seemed, that would get you a psychedelic liftoff? So, so that's why we then did this experiment. And it was interesting because, of course, what we were doing was engaging in a long tradition of self-experimentation 
Schultes himself had eaten his way through the Amazon. And this kind of self-experimentation is ethically so much more legitimate than the subversive use of drugs um, injected into uh, inmates in penitentiaries, either without their permission or without even their knowledge. Now, it was, of course, one thing to show, as we did, um, that the venom smoked was hallucinogenic, which we, in fact, did. Uh, it was quite another to prove that the substance had been used in um, in, in pre-Columbian times. When we smoked the venom, again, we were part of this tradition. Schultes, Albert Hoffman, when Schultes and Wasson sent Hoffman the first samples of mushrooms from, uh, uh, from the Mazatec in Oaxaca in the early 1950s, what does Hoffman do? The first thing he does is divide the lot into half, gives half to his dog, nothing happens. He eats the other half and something does happen and the psychedelic era begins, if you will. And that is exactly what he had done, albeit inadvertently, when he accidentally dosed himself with LSD in 1943 and went on the world's most magical bicycle trip, the world's first acid trip. So we knew that um, the toad was psychoactive. The question is, was it or had it been used by the ancient peoples of pre-Columbian South America? Well, it turns out a colleague of ours in anthropology, the late Peter First, had in fact, while he was at University of Pennsylvania, drawn attention to Bufo alvarius. But again, he didn't understand that it had to be smoked. Uh, it couldn't be taken orally and thus he had not been able to verify its actual psychoactive properties. We were able to do that scientifically for the first time in these self-experiments. Now, of course, we were aware, thanks to Peter's work and that of the um, other Mayan and Aztec and uh, um, uh, pre-Columbian scholars, that there had been extensive trade routes from the Sonoran Desert to Mesoamerica that had been well documented. And it was struck us as obvious that this dried venom would be an excellent object of trade. If you think about it, it's an axiom of long distance commerce in any uh, culture at any time in history that the ideal trading item is something that is highly esteemed, easy to transport, difficult or impossible to get at the point of exchange and readily obtained at the point of origin, at the source. Well, certainly Bufo alvarius venom meets all such requirements. Think about this. One toad yields 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, half a gram of the dried venom. Since concentrations of 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine may be as high as 15% in these glands, it means that a single toad may yield 75 milligrams of a hallucinogenic drug that when smoked is effective in humans at doses of three to five milligrams. In other words, a single toad produces 12 to 25 doses of one of the most potent psychoactive drugs found in nature. A container the size of a matchbox could hold thousands of effective doses. Now at this point, both Andy and I believed, along with Peter, but had no proof that the ancient peoples of Mesoamerica used Bufo alvarius as a hallucinogen. Now on the basis of solid chemical and pharmacological evidence, we were quite certain that they did not use Bufo marinus. But there was still this puzzling issue of the of the ubiquity and concentration of Bufo marinus bones at middens throughout Central America. And while the archaeologist Richard Hansen was no doubt correct in suggesting that Bufo marinus was consumed as a food, the fact remained that the toad was often found in ritual contexts. Well, there are several plausible explanations. The most obvious was that the toads were indeed ritual offerings Again, not because they were hallucinogenic, but because they embodied a wealth 
of powerful symbolic meanings. But there was one other possibility. Both Bufo Marinus and Bufo Alvarius are, as you've seen, enormous toads uh, readily distinguished from many other species in the genus by their sheer size. They can be 12 inches across. And so in studying the remains of the amphibious component at these midden sites, archaeologists would have no difficulty separating Bufo Marinus bones from the remains of any other toad uh, native to the region, and they wouldn't even think to compare them to Bufo alvarius, this obscure toad found in a completely different habitat several hundred miles away. So the next thing we did is we got in touch with the uh, paleo uh, archaeologist Elizabeth Wing at the University of Florida, who had been responsible for identifying the Bufo Marinus remains at the midden sites at uh, San Lorenzo and other ancient sites. We asked her over the phone whether it was possible that some of those bones used in ritual context and identified as Bufo Marinus could in fact have been Bufo Alvarius. And she said, I am sure, as she wrote us back in a letter, that Bufo Alvarius was not considered a possibility in the identifications I made from material in Veracruz and Belize. I am sure I just looked at the regional species and the large size of Bufo Marinus separated it easily. And so intrigued, inspired by our inquiries, she examined one large specimen of Bufo Alvarius that she found in the collections at the University of Florida's Museum of Natural History, and she concurred that it was indeed very difficult to distinguish the two species. And so, whereas it would, it would now be, by all means, it was premature to conclude that the ancient peoples of the Americas used Bufo Alvarius as a sacred intoxicant, Andy and I nevertheless had made certain important discoveries. We had, had after all, opened a new ethnographic and ethnohistorical vistas for anthropologists and decisively laid to rest the deeply flawed and dangerous notion that Bufo Marinus could get you high. And with luck, we thought word would spread and fewer kids, fewer individuals in general, wouldn't end up in hospital emergency rooms having licked the venom glands, parotid glands of Bufo Marinus. In addition, we had demonstrated that the secretions of Bufo alvarius, though known to be toxic when consumed orally, could be safely smoked and were powerfully psychoactive by that route of administration. And so those experiments of ours represented the first evidence of an animal agent from the animal kingdom, even as we provided clear evidence of a psychoactive toad that could have been used by the pre-Columbian peoples of any number of ancient civilizations in the New World. And we, of course, submitted the papers that we wrote uh, to both Nature and Science, thinking that we'd end up on the front page of one or the other. Instead, we ended up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the Toronto Globe and Mail, almost arrested with the ac accusation of having tried to start a new drug cult. So the response to our papers was rather extraordinary as Andy and I became the fulcrum about an ongoing debate about self-experimentation in science. So many scientists expressed their outrage that we had actually sampled the venom on ourselves as opposed to employing the analytical techniques of a modern laboratory. But of course, in responding, our position was unequivocal. We hadn't entered those self-experiments blindly, but with great care and consideration. And as, we, as far as we knew it, we wrote slightly tongue-in-cheek, the Uto Aztecan people, not to mention the Maya and the Olmec, had not had white frock technicians, precisely calibrated scales, or white rats caged in laboratories. We had to show that the venom was psychoactive in humans, not in rats, and it was, and it was. And far better to, um, to absorb the substance, to experiment one, with one's own body than to use the bodies of prisoners either through coercion 
or against their will and consent. And as Andy wrote, I think that kind of the kind of experience which comes from direct experience makes for the best kind of science. Well, of course, this did not quiet our critics. A reviewer concluded that our papers, quote, seem to amount to little more than an endorsement for abuse of a hallucinogenic material with potentially deadly side effects. And so apparently, in unveiling the truth about the potentially deadly bufomerinus, we were guilty of fomenting a new drug craze. But of course, even had we wanted that honor, it would have been too late. A front page story in the Wall Street Journal, toad, gain, toad smoking gains on toad licking among drug users revealed what was really going on among toad connoisseurs. Our research was discussed in that article, but the genesis of the report lay somewhere else. On Monday, January 24th, 1994, California drug agents arrested Robert Shepard, a 41-year-old teacher and naturalist at Angel's Camp, about 100 miles east of San Francisco. Also nabbed in the sting were four pet toads, which Shepard had named Hans, Franz, Peter, and Brian. The war on drugs had hit a new low. The, the man involved, um, Shepard, was not, in the words of the narcotics agent who busted him, quote, your average maggot-looking dope dealer on the corner. He was a model citizen with no previous criminal record. The authorities were not sure what to do with the suspects or the family toads. Here's some guy who squeezes toads for Christ's sake, remarked John Schlimm, a veteran narcotics agent. We don't really get much training in this area. Nor was there much of a legal precedent. I was able to show that the shepherds were the first um, individuals to be charged criminally with the possession of a toad for illicit purposes since 1579. That was the year that Mother Dutton of Clewith Parish in England was accused of frolicking intimately with a toad in her flower garden. Declared a witch, she was executed. Bob Shepard was condemned to make an instructional video for the county's narcotics enforcement team and viewing the final film, remarked one agent, was quote, like watching the Discovery Channel. It was very pleasant, he's a nice guy. So Bob Shepard nevertheless lost his job and was put into rehab for the crime of possessing a toad. What has made his activity illegal was the fact that the venom contained bufotenin, a compound with no hallucinogenic properties. At the time, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine was not deemed to be illicit. And so in the years since his arrest, I have to say that the worst fears of the drug enforcement agents have mercifully not been realized. Smoking toads has not swept the nation. For reasons I guess I just can't understand, the practice of milking the glands of a living toad, drying the venom on glass, and inhaling a substance that sends one into the nether world of oblivion just didn't catch on. And we may never know whether or not the ancient peoples of the Americas, the Maya, the Olmec, the Aztec, and other peoples of pre-Columbian Central America and Mexico ever really did discover the properties of Bufo alvarius. There is very little evidence in the modern ethnographic record that the toads were ever used in shamanic or folk culture by the first peoples of the region. But one thing we can be sure of, they too were on the outlook always for magic potions. And even if they didn't discover the essence of the magic toad of the Sonoran Desert, they sure certainly would have envied white dogs good fortune to have done so. Thanks very much.
Okay. Uh, there we go. How's that? Can you hear me now? I, uh, I can't hear. Shannon? Do I have sound now? Yeah, now you have sound. Okay, wonderful. Sorry about that. What an amazing story there, Wade. I can't believe um, the look on uh, that border crossing guard's face. I can only imagine <laughs> opening up your suitcase. <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting how times have changed and how um, how now you know there's certain things we can't you know get over the border. But uh, that was definitely a pleasure listening to you. So thank you so much for sharing that and. I just also want to say that it's an honor to have you speak on the webinar series again because of your breadth of knowledge and your experience and your time in the field of psychedelics. You've been around uh, in this field for such a long time and you have so many stories. So it's so wonderful to have you share those with us. So we do have a few questions here and uh, let's see, we'll start with the one that's voted at the top. This is from Sarah. She says, can we hear a bit more detail about what kind of hallucinations, either visual or auditory, um, might have come about? How does the hallucinogenic effect of this toxin differ from other psychedelics, if it does at all? Well, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, it's, it's anytime one tries to explain uh, the subjective effects of one of these substances, you know, you, you're, you're kind of at a loss for words. It goes right back to those wonderful lines of Gordon Watson when he first took mushrooms and he said trying to explain the experience was like trying to tell a blind man what it was like to see. I mean, I think in general, those of you who are familiar with dimethyltryptamine would, will, uh, would sort of have a sense of the impact of these powerful tryptamines. But 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine is sort of, in my opinion, orders of magnitude stronger. So when you um, you smoke it, you literally kind of dissolve into a into a sea of uh, of color. Um, I mean, I you know it, it's not for the faint-hearted. Some people would say. I um, I remember the very first time I, I smoked pure five methoxy uh, many many years ago, uh, and uh, at the time I literally felt that I had died. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we recorded the sessions, and I was certain that I was dead. And of course, these substances are very benign; they're very short-acting. Um, but while you're in the experience, it seems like an eternity. And uh, it turns out that I was, as I was uh, in that experience, uh, a single note was echoing out of my lungs for the entire time. And I, when I came around, uh, my first words were, "I, I, I feel like uh, I've been a bellows for God." And, and I immediately said, having been so frightened of the experience in the moment, overwhelmed by it, I, my next words were, I want to go back there. You know, so I think it, you know, um, the, these substances are very, very powerful. And they, and they create, as, in all seriousness, as, as Terence said, not, not a kind of distortion of reality, a kind of disillusion of reality. I think that's why it's really important that people are guided on these experiences. Um, um, and uh, knowing full well that the substances themselves are pharmacologically benign because after all, brain serotonin is a tryptamine in a sense. And so we absorb them, we metabolize them quickly. Uh, there are very few side effects. The, the experience is over, uh, the acute phase is over within minutes and, and, and the utter phase is over within half an hour. Um, but but it, it, you know, it, it's a rocket ship to the divine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you said it's important that these experiences are guided, um, which somewhat leads into the next. I think so. Is, is that what are your thoughts on integrating these experiences? Well, you know, I, th I you know, again, I, you know, I, Shannon, I have a, you know, I, 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 I think I've said last time, I mean, I'm very much in the Ram Dass camp with psychedelics, get the message and hang up. In other words, when I was young, trying to deconstruct a world, that had been imposed upon me, I found the use of these substances absolutely revelatory. And I say very 
uh, publicly and, and, and proudly. I wouldn't write the way I write. I wouldn't think the way I think. I wouldn't put words together the way I do. I wouldn't relate to the natural world, to women, to issues of gender. I mean, everything. I mean, you know, as I always joke, our, you know, I, I, our parents used to say to us, don't take these substances, you'll never come back the same. And of course, that was a bloody, whole bloody point. But that said, you know, having kind of deconstructed one life and built another, um, a, a life beyond the imaginings of both my parents, but also myself as a young boy, I'm not that interested in having it torn apart now. You know, I mean, I've, but you know, I think that I think that also gets you into sort of the whole Vedic notion of the stages of life. You know, when you're a child, you're a child. When you're a young boy or girl, you're 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 coming of age. You're you know you're you're on a journey from the Blakeian journey from innocence to experience, and then you become a householder and you focus your energy on your partner, your family. You build something. And then, of course, in, in the way of the sadhus, you know, you, you wander off to face the ultimate challenge, the ultimate moment, which is death. And I, I can see myself after years and years and years of personally not using psychedelics. Well, that's not true. It hasn't really been years because I keep getting people that pop by and, you know, but in general, it's not been a focus of my life for a long time. Um, uh, but I can see myself now that I'm 66. If, if my body will put up with it, I might, I might um, do a little experimentation in the, in, in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's so good to hear, you know, that you say when you get the message and hang up the phone, um, just uh, for safety reasons too. Um, well, I think, you know, I think everybody, you know, I think there, I, I, I think that, you know, obviously the, everybody's got their own relationship with these substances and these substances by definition, as Andy always said, have a kind of ambivalent potential for good or evil. They just create a template upon which emotional, psychological, uh, social dynamics can come to the fore and be, be obviously be accentuated. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and so, you know, everybody's got a different relationship to them. So I'm not being judgmental in saying that I got the message and hung up. But I, but I think, you know, that's sort of a difference between the classic difference in a way between Tim Leary and Richard Albert. Albert got the message and he didn't hang up on life. He, he, he wanted, you know, it's like Dennis McKenna says, these substances bring the background to the foreground. You know, these substances reveal... Uh, a, a, another dimension of reality that in the moment seems to be the real world and what we live in on a mundane basis seems to be a crude facsimile of that dynamic and magical world. And, and of course, the, 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 um, the unfortunate thing about these substances, or one might say the fortunate thing, I we couldn't function, is that we do come down. We drop back into this mundane world. And I think the religious quest of someone like Ramdas was to ask, as my wife does in her Buddhist practice, how do we achieve that sense of space, that sense of being uh, through meditation or through other vehicles, other avenues to the divine? I and mean, that's kind of a perpetual quest of people, you know? Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, and as we're making our way through life on our way to enlightenment, you know, we're dealing with these karmas and these samskaras and these lessons per se. So the phone might ring again, right? <laughs> you yeah, might have no, to pick it up. It. That's, that's it. I mean, it could well. I mean, it, could, it really could. Mm -hmm. And then there's another message and then you do the work, right? And it's, yeah. it's a continual basis. Yeah. There. So um, we have a question here from... Tamara, and she asks, do you think the psychedelic renaissance could tolerate outdoor nature-based experiences as research? What about the value of outdoor versus indoor set and setting? I, I think that's a wonderful question. I mean, you know, there, there's a sort of, um, you know, there's a legitimate focus, particularly with ayahuasca, because it's often used at night. It's an inter you know, the trip means our internal um, journeys. I mean, 5-methoxy is not something that you're going to take and do anything but lie on your back and be there, right? It's an internal journey. Um, and and uh, I, I personally find um, those internal journeys, in a sense, less interesting because I'm very much of the, of the natural world. You know, what I, what I prefer... And again, this is everybody. I mean, it's classic to me that the McKenna's, who are like brothers to me, but Terrence and Dennis are geniuses. And they are, in the best sense of the word, 
in their heads, right? I mean, that's what makes them so dynamic and everything. I'm much more sensual in my body, you know, physical. I grew up in the bush. I, you know, I work, you know, as a, a you know, I've been in the bush, park ranger, guide, hunting guide, wilderness guide, rafting guide. I mean, I grew up in the bush and I, and I, I love the natural world. It's, I'm much more like in the camp of Gary Snyder, who's a great hero of mine. That's, that's, he's my model. And, and so I personally prefer things like San Pedro cactus and the Indo groups that sort of are more sensual um, MDMA or something like that, or, or what, what, what kind of creates physicality and physical connection to the natural world. And I, I actually think that, uh, I, you know, and I, I, I say this with no authority, uh, but running off to the Amazon and taking ayahuasca uh, in in a kind of a commercial sense or even whatever sense, I'm not. I've never thought that ayahuasca would be very useful in therapy. I think that it's possible that the tryptamines could be useful in hospice, in palliative care, in in getting people prepared in a sense for the great journey in the sky, the the void of death, or at least beginning to imagine in a way that the void that comes with death may not be as scary as we all fear it might be. Um, but in terms of tools to allow you to change your life, to be a different person, I think the greatest message of these plants is what they can do to infuse our imaginings with a deep appreciation of nature. The way that you can take San Pedro or peyote uh, and and stare at a blade of grass emerging from the desert sand and simply be uh, for for an hour or more um, overwhelmed by the miracle of photosynthesis and come away with this deep powerful appreciation that as Dennis says the plants are here to teach us you know so I I've always found those kind of physical sensual uh, visceral um, uh, um, uh, uh, tactile. Uh, and, and and very much you know not I, I not taking a trip to mean like even ayahuasca that kind of leaves me prostrate you know that obliterates my agency I want I I personally prefer the substances that that empower me that make me feel even more aware more conscious more in the moment more more my eye under the world very conscious of my identity very much in my power and interpreting the natural world uh, with a totally different way um, from that of my father. That's what there's, that's how I grow. I mean, that's how, how in some sense I, I went from someone who had never studied biology, uh, even in high school to ending up getting a PhD in biology at Harvard. It's because I became so amazed by nature in good measure through the psychedelic experience. I mean, the night uh, I, figured out the uh, metabolic pathways that give us photosynthesis, the, the formula of life. You know, this amazing, amazing thing that, you know, carbon dioxide and water sparked by photons of light will give us the food we eat and the air we breathe. Once I figured out how that worked chemically, I, I went nuts. And I was actually asked uh, by the security guards to leave the science library at Harvard because I was disrupting the peace as I went from table to table, shaking and screaming at people, do you have any idea what this is? It's God in a, you know, in a, in a formula, you know? And of course I was a lunatic, but, um, uh, but that's how I felt about it. So I, I, I don't separate my experiences viscerally with San Pedro in particular from the path that led me to the serious study of science. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, uh, and like you said, you know, just staring at the blade of grass, it, it not only gives one a greater experience of that moment, but it just makes your life better when you can connect at that level with all that is, you know, whether we're using psychedelics to deal with issues and trauma, but we can also use them to just be better people. Yeah, I think so. I, mean, I think I, I always say, I think I said last time, Shannon, when you, all of us, when we look at the, uh, you know, if you look at the certitudes of Edwardian England about the role of women, the role of men, the, the nature of race, you know, you name it across the board. Uh, not one of us in this modern age would 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 agree with any of those certitudes. And in many cases, we'd see them as being both morally reprehensive and, and sort of transparently stupid.
you know, I mean, um, and yet when we try to track how we went from thinking like that as say a, a European society to thinking as we do now with women, as I always say, going from the kitchen to the boardroom, uh, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay people from the closet to the altar, all in one generation. Um, how do we leave? How do we possibly leave out of the uh, formula of the recipe of social transformation uh, the fact that millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe having taken one of these substances? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they're definitely, definitely important to me. I mean, Shannon, I always, I often, and I don't, I don't want to go on, we get some more questions, but, you know, there's sometimes when I do so much public speaking and I, and I know the material so well because it's, I've written and made the books, um, mm -hmm. I can sometimes literally be at the podium and I just, it's like anything else, you do it so much, you're comfortable. And I can be giving a complete presentation um, and yet have my mind completely somewhere else. And um, there have been times when I, I almost dissociate and I'm almost like watching this persona at the podium saying these things. And there've been moments when I go, wow, you know, where did those thoughts come from? How did that little boy raised in that bourgeois banal suburb of Montreal, you know, in a world that treated women like that, you know, in a world where his father, you know, how did, how did this, person. I, I don't mean that in any way to be precious or uh, suggest that I'm special, but we can all do that. You know, you stand up and you ask yourself, Shannon, how on earth did you go from that little blonde girl? Um, you know, like, I mean, you were so many things, you know, I mean, Miss whatever, Miss Canada or whatever the heck it was, all these, you know, you know, you had this whole other life and now you've gone and you're this and, and not to denigrate any of the other life and not to reject it. It's all part of who you are. But you cannot leave out of the equation of your own personal, uh, emotional, religious, spiritual, psychological transformation, becoming the person who is organizing this today without acknowledging that you you opened your mind in a different way. And I think oh. that's really terrific. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't be close to being where I am today if I hadn't opened my mind, right? And that's, I think that's part of our quest and our journey here is to evolve our consciousness, you know, to be in our consciousness, to be, um, to be in control of it, right? To be in control of the mind. Yeah, I mean, you know, my friend Matthew Ricard, the great Buddhist scholar says, you know, uh, you know, drifting, I mean, he, he, said, he says the challenge in life is to take control of the rudder you know otherwise you're drifting i mean you know it's like you're journeying boom point to point you know mm -hmm. well maybe there's a question if we, if we uh yeah it looks like um we have dr king patel here has one and he says have you heard of any groups working on novel ways to predictably prolong the 5 e.m dmt trip during duration by slowing down an extending rate of alveolar absorption no, I, I, you know, I'm not a practitioner and, and, and by no means uh, an expert, um, you know, and that would obviously be a great question for Dennis McKenna. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we have one here from Nurse Kelly. She says, humane venom extraction from snakes, lizards, arthropods, etc., for research and medical purposes has gone through an evolution process over time to its present daily mythology and WHO guidelines. I am a novice to concepts regarding psychoactive toads. Four questions. Number one, let's, we'll read the first one. Do you see these creatures becoming a part of extraction clinics in some capacity? Well, I think, I think there's a, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the um, real challenges when, when any of these substances become uh, pursued um, is is um, the, the risk to their to their um, their status. I mean, peyote, of course, has been hunted down and uh, virtually exterminated in vast parts of its former range. It's the same thing with these toads. the The range of Bufo alvarius is not that great, and if you have people, and they're very easy to find. Uh, so, and, and you could easily see how someone even with good intentions, could do damage to the animal um, through the quite traumatic um, intervention of actually squeezing their glands on the glass. So, I mean, I think I think conservation of these substances is like conservation of the wild uh, 
um, lianas of Banisteriopsis capi are important, you know, um, issues um, for wherever we use these substances, like anything else we use as humans. Mm -hmm. She also asked. I, I don't. I don't personally think that the the use of this venom is going to catch on in some kind of powerful way. Of course, I didn't think that about ayahuasca either, and I was wrong there. But but I think that the five methoxy experience is is pretty intense and. Um, um, you know, as William Burroughs said, not for the faint-hearted. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't see it being, and I, I, I don't see it being any danger in the sense that um, it's short-lived, it's pharmacologically benign. But again, it, it's um, it's a level of intensity that I think it's best to be guided during that moment. Can the secretions be obtained without harming or killing the toads? Yes, the answer is yes. But again, you know, how many people will inadvertently harm the toad? I mean, I'm again, I'm no authority on, on milking Bufa alvarius toads. I just happened to write these academic papers 30, 40 years ago. Um, let's see. She also has a, another question here. Have the chemical compounds been fully studied already or are there potential discoveries yet to be made? I think in terms of toad venom, it's it's pretty well known because again, these 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 combinations are used for taxonomic delineation. Okay. And is the toxin detectable in any body fluid testing? I don't know. I mean, I think I think the uh, the one remaining real unknown that's that is curious to me uh, is these bufo various toads clearly do cause morbid morbidity and more uh, mortality. Um, if they're mouthed by dogs, which is quite frequent in the Sonoran Desert. And uh, so what is it that's actually killing the dogs? And is that just denatured by the process of smoking? I assume that's what's going on. And I think there's, you know, much as I dismiss Bufo Penning as being hallucinogenic, I'm sure there's some phytochemists or, 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 or pharmacologists who may argue that Bufo Tenning is in fact psychoactive. I mean, I, I, all the reports I've seen, I've never seen it being psychoactive, but again, you know, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, so I yield to people like Dennis. Mm -hmm. We have one question here that we somewhat already uh, touched on and it's from Carrie and he says, can you discuss the importance of studying these compounds by experience within the context of human consciousness? Well, I think that's what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, we're 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 all. I mean, I I mean, I think I think the, the, the you know historically and and why this Renaissance is so important um, is that you know we do all come from this Descartian world, um, uh, which is a wonderful world. It, you know, it's given us a certain. It's liberated the individual from the collective. It's given us great mobility. It's given us great freedom. Uh, free of, um, you know, the, the tyranny of absolute faith. We're free of the um, the tyranny of the collective, you know, the, the, the community. Um, you know, I don't think any of us, no matter how much we may admire the integrity and legitimacy and, and, and the wonder of indigenous cultures, uh, I'm not prepared to have my father tell me who to marry. I'm not prepared to have my daughter um, accept orders from me as to who she, you know, I could go on and on. Um, but we, but we do come from a world in which um, the material dominates, where metaphor um, almost has no place, and all notions of myth, magic, and mysticism have been thrown out. And and um, I, I think these substances, for those of us who come from this uh, very successful worldview, if you will, uh, these substances are are one of the shortcuts. You know, they give us a way of, of uh, cracking open the sky, if you will, you know, um, in a way that, you know, I'm, I mean, I think that it's, it's classic that people come out of the experience with these entheogens and turn to Eastern religion. I think the, the, the esoterica or the, or the practice of, of Buddhism um, uh, might make a little bit less sense or be a little, the Baroque elements of the religion might be a more, more off-putting or the whole thing might be more of a challenge if people hadn't already had a subjective experience of something close to what the Buddha is talking about. And that's why I think we can then move down. So I, I think in, in that sense, these substances are, uh, you know, used judici judiciously, thoughtfully, with intention um, and care uh, 
uh, but with an open heart and open imagination, I think these substances really um, can be absolutely transformative for human beings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Wade. It looks like we're over time now. I'm wondering if you have any final words to say here to the audience before we uh, let you go for the evening. No, no, I just, I think that, you know, I think we should just remember that um, uh, uh, whenever we talk about using illicit substances, we end up, we're part of this um, apparatus, this state dominated um, uh, control. Uh, and, um, you know, not all substances are the same. And if people are tempted to use cocaine, I just would encourage them to remember that every time you use cocaine, you're causing death in Colombia, death of the rainforest and agony for the Colombian people. And if you question that, just have a look at this new book of mine, Magdalena, River of Dreams, and you'll come away with a different take on cocaine. Get rid of cocaine, embrace coca the divine leaf of immortality. Mm -hmm. And that book just came out in September and I think it's available on Amazon, right? Oh yeah, you bet. Wonderful. Oh, thanks everybody for joining in. God bless you all. Thanks so much, Wade. It's always a pleasure to have you. And I know you have many more stories, so uh, it would be great to hear some more of them and have you back someday. So okay. thank you. Bye-bye. All right, so just to close up the episode here today, I'd like to take this time to thank again our speaker, Wade Davis, and uh, his support for Maps Canada. Also, thank you to all of you for being here to support the series, the speakers, and of course, this important research. A special thank you as well to all of our sponsors who not only sponsor episodes, but also supply the perks for the webinar series. And it looks like um, it'll be popped in the chat here in a bit if you already haven't checked out the perks. Our next episode is going to be next week, December 15th with CEO of Theracil, Spencer Hawkswell. And uh, we will be discussing the progress they've made with psilocybin for end of life distress. Uh, so make sure and tune in for that same time next Tuesday, December 15th. And just a note on compassionate pricing, tis the season for giving. So if you know someone that can benefit from these lectures, please email us at webinar at mapscanada.org. We'll send you a special code. Um, if you know anyone who is strapped financially that would like to attend that can't, make sure and email us. And uh, we will definitely be able to help them out there as well. So thank you again to all of you for attending. Thank you again to Wade Davis. Again, always a pleasure to hear him speak. Thank you so much for being here, Wade. And thank you to all of you for attending. And don't forget to be kind and, uh, and help each other out, out there, especially through these times that we're going through right now. So we'll see you all again next week. Bye for now. <laughs>